Hi guys, Nick Jennison from Guitar Interactive, GI Plus. It's Monday. We're doing the thing that we do on Mondays, which is twofold. Today, I am clashing horrendously with the colours in the backdrop, but we're also playing guitar. We're doing the thing that we do on Monday evenings, which is hang out and talk about the guitar. Today, we are continuing our discussion on all things music theory, which is why I've cracked the acoustic guitar out. Don't worry if you got your electric, because this is all going to be applicable to that too. But uh, the good folks at Elixir have asked us, they really enjoyed the stream we did a couple of weeks ago, and they said, hey, listen, can you do a couple more streams? discussing things like, you know, little uh, tweaks and little adjustments uh, that we can make to our chord playing, to our lead playing. We want to know a little bit more about that sort of stuff. And can you do it on an acoustic? Because the acoustic sounded so nice with those strings they kindly provided for us. So who am I to say no to an invitation like that? So we got the acoustic out. We are discussing, as the title would suggest, the hidden chords that are within your scales. I really wanted to call this stream uh, something along the lines of like crouching scale hidden chord, but uh, apparently puns were not to be done. Um, but that's okay. That's fine. Um, today, anyway, we're discussing some chords, some arpeggios that you will find hidden, nestled within the scales that you already know. I uh, want to thank you for joining us, by the way, if it's your first time coming on board. Hey, welcome. We do these streams every Monday. It's always a blast, right? We have a great community of guitar players who come and watch us pretty much every week, unless they're off doing exciting band things. Marcy and I am looking at you. Um, but yeah, a lot of great guitar players in the comments. We love hearing from you guys. Our community is absolutely fabulous. So if it's your first time here, hey, welcome. Drop us a comment. Let us know how you're getting on. Let us know if there's any questions that you have. We'll be answering your questions a little bit later on at the, say, the 45-minute mark-ish, give or take. We're here for an hour together. Um, so we've got all sorts of stuff we can get through. Also, a couple of ways that you can help us keep the lights on. By the way, if you're one of, one of our... One of our, one of our, one of our, easy, well, easy for me to say, he said twice, um, one of our returning streamers, it's great to see you. Hey, listen, thanks for coming back on board. It's, it's a pleasure. A couple of ways you can help us keep the lights on uh, is you can do the following. You can wear a red t-shirt against a pink and a blue uh, backdrop. If anybody here is colorblind, you're welcome. Um, but yeah, a couple of ways you can help us keep the lights on. You can do the following. You can go to this URL down here, which is guitarinteractivemagazine.com forward slash GI hyphen plus where you can go and find more great guitar lessons from the likes of myself but if you want acoustic stuff you can go and check out lessons by Don Alder by Manelli Jamal Manelli stuff is very very cool he's an elixir artist so you know a uh, nice little tie in there I guess but he's a fabulous guitar player great teacher we also have lessons from Sam Bell from myself from Giorgio Cerchi from Tom Quayle Rick Graham Andy Wood Andy James Michael Cowswell Lewis Turner you name it they are in there and it's growing uh so listen hey we'll, we'll not talk about that all day go to come other things you can do to help us keep the lights on metaphorically speaking i am tripping over my words today because I'll tell you for why and if i'm making funny noises this is why i have the dual uh i guess the dual curses of an oncoming cold and hay fever which have landed at the same time i'll tell you when they landed they landed right before the second set uh at my gig on Saturday. So I'm singing, first set, I'm really feeling myself. I'm like, hey, we are on form tonight. And then I get up on the second set and suddenly I've turned into Marge Simpson. Uh, and this is why hay fever is kicking me in the proverbial, uh, but I've also caught a cold in the process. So uh, stumbling my words, cause you know, struggling to speak. But if I make coughing noises, that's why I do apologize. But you know, anyway, a couple of ways you can help keep the lights on and you can help keep me from the verge of death. Um, you can give us a thumbs up on whatever platform you're watching on. You can also uh, share this with your guitar player friends if you have a guitar players in your life who you feel would get some use out of this stream hey please share it with them we'd love to reach as many guitar players as we can with this one also uh, another way you can help us is you can drop us a comment all of these are free they cost you nothing and they help us out a great deal if you're watching us on youtube by the way consider giving us a subscription to great uh, that, that really has helped greatly. So, yeah, anyway, listen, let's check in with our streamers and then we'll get into the meat of today's session because there are loads of comments that I'm trying to read as I'm talking to you guys. So let's see what's going on. First of all, PJ has finally beat Marcin through the door. PJ, a round of applause for you, my man. Well done. Marcin is our first through the door every single day. He's always the first one here. And today, PJ has won the race. PJ... What can I say? Anyway, listen, PJ says, uh, hello, Nick and everyone. Ready for another awesome lesson. I've introduced a few friends, so hopefully they'll turn up. Hey, listen, if you're one of PJ's friends, hey, welcome on board. You know, thanks for coming. Appreciate, appreciate you being here. Uh, 
Magic. Hey, thanks for inviting your friends. I appreciate that. Okay. Uh, Marcin says, I just got back from Mystic Festival where I saw Testament, uh, Behemoth, Ghost, Gojira, and many more. I'm pretty tired, but it was an incredible experience. That sounds like a hell of a lineup, man. Um, Gojira are, um, to my mind, the single, like, most potent band I've ever seen live. They were outrageous. I mean, they're pretty heavy on, re on record, but like, man, just something about that live show is, is wild. Uh, and we love Testament too. Alex Skolnick, the man. Uh, who else do we have in the house? Sacred God Slayer is here. Uh, hi, Nick. Hi, guys. Sacred God Slayer is our resident metal expert. It's good to have you on board, man. Uh, I know you've bought the... <laughs> <laughs> he brought the wrong guitar today. Don't worry. All this stuff is going to be applicable, I promise. Uh, David Yates says, Hello, Nick. Hello, guys. David, I hope you're feeling better, man. I hope the hands are treating you well. Uh, I noticed you've ordered some new strings. We'll get into that in a minute because string gauge are very, very interesting. Uh, Mark Crandall says, Hey, guys. Hey, Nick. I'm so glad these sessions are a full hour. Those half hour Lick, lab, lick, uh, lick Library sessions are just too short. You know, we have actually thought that. So we've, we've taken your feedback on board, and I think I'm personally going to push a little longer on my streams, I think. I'll still be doing Lick Library streams from time to time. They won't be regular uh, in the same way that this GI stream is regular, but I'll be doing maybe one a month. I'll always let you guys know when this one coming up. Uh, I think we should push them longer, though. I think that's a good suggestion, my man. Uh, but hey, man, thanks. I'm glad you like the hour. Some people will go, dude, you talk for an hour. Please shut up. Uh, anyway, so, Dave Yates. Um, we have a... Uh, oh, talking about David Yates' hands and his hand health. Has uh, just been resting them, referring to his hands. I'm not rushing it. I've ordered some new strings for my seven string and I'm going to have the guitar set up going for a custom set with uh, later high strings. A custom set may very well be the move. Now, I've played with custom sets before in the, in the past. We'll talk a little bit about string gauges, I guess, in a second, but string gauges are an interesting one because the, um, I have to, excuse me, I think I'm going to sneeze. Bear with me one second. That's that hay fever coming to get me, right? I'm a hay fever sufferer. It's terrible. I love the warm weather, but I promise I'll try my best to mute my mic when I'm sneezing. So, uh, but my sneezes get stuck for some reason. I think it's because I'm nearly 40. But uh, anyway, um, so what were I saying? Oh, yeah, string gauges. So uh, here's an interesting thing on string gauges. I know we're here, not here to talk about string gauges, but the modern conventional set of string gauges is, to my mind kind of a relic of the past. So if we take a look at the strings I've got in here, these strings are an 11 set. So it's a set of 11 uh, to, to my mind, 52, I think it is. Uh, I restrung this a little while ago when Elixir first um, gave us some strings. These are the same strings, and they still sound fantastic because Elixirs last forever. Um, but if we go to the close-up cam real quick, I'll show you what's going on here. We have 11, 16, I think, 24, 32, 42, 52. Now, where the modern nine string gauge, you may be recognizing these numbers, came from, is it's actually an 11 set with the low string taken off. And then all of these strings are moved up one position. So this string is put in the B space, and this string is put in the G space, etc. which is why we get uh, 9, 11, 16, and so on and so forth. Um, now, where the nine comes from is the nine is traditionally a banjo string. Now, the reason guitar players did this is as the electric guitar evolved uh, and playing styles changed, we uh, wanted a little bit more bendability out of our strings, a bit more of a, I guess, a flexible kind of kind of feel or maybe a, a, a tighter tone that you get from light strings. Light strings are great if you can handle them. If you can keep them in tune, they sound absolutely fantastic because they have this brightness and snap to them. Uh, me personally, as my hands have gotten a bit stronger, I've had to move to heavier strings, but I actually think I prefer the sound of lighter strings. Um, I don't know where this meme that big strings equals big tone came from. I think in some circumstances it's true, but if you're using even a modicum of overdrive, uh, the light string can often sound a ton better. Case in point, uh, Jimmy Page, Tony Iommi, Ingve Malmsteen, Angus Young, Brian May, uh, all light string users, all with fantastic tone. Michael Schenker, everyone in the 80s, uh, Alan Holdsworth, George Lynch, um, you name it, all eights or nines at the heaviest. Um, <clears throat> Paul Gilbert, eights, etc., etc., etc. Anyway, so just with this anyway, the reason I'm bringing this up is that the high strings, especially the very highest string, is normally a little heavy uh, for a given string gauge. And that's fine if your hands are in good shape, but if you're kind of struggling, which I've had in the past on like long runs of shows, for example, uh, where bending became a bit of a chore, the easiest thing you can do is just sub out the highest string for the next half gauge down. So a gauge that I really like is I really like um, ten and a halfs, they're absolutely fantastic. Ten and a halfs with a ten on the top. 
that's really really nice or you can do uh like nine and a halfs which are like 12 16 f two, what are they 26 44 34 44 with a nine on the top and it kind of evens out that um i guess the string tension so as you start to get to the higher strings uh it starts to get a little bit looser anyway if you have a hand issues this is uh, this is gold right so don't be afraid to mess with your string gauges is i guess what i'm trying to say and lighter string gauges can sound absolutely fabulous uh and they can even sound better if you can deal with them satan god slayer's got a good suggestion as well though let's take your time uh eventually practice uh solfeggio and study theory so you won't stray uh away too much from music i'm gonna throw another one into the mix uh which might be a lot of fun uh is maybe try playing some slide uh, because you can just kind of keep your hand there. You can keep your hand in one position, slide it around. If it doesn't give you any bother, maybe now is the time to become a fabulous slide player. Uh, but yeah, these all look like really solid gauges. Um, that's a really good shout. Uh, should help my hands put less effort into bending strings, for sure. Anyway, on with the stream. So uh, Kim is in the house. Kim, it's great to see you. I was chatting with Kim uh, in Gateshead, of all places. Uh, earlier on today, Kim is on the train. Hopefully your internet's holding up, man. Uh, it was good to see you today. Uh, hope you got some sunshine. Um, anyway, who else? we have timothy appling is here hey uh hello nick uh, and fellow guitarist i like the subject line in today's lesson hopefully you'll like more than the subject line man we got some good stuff for you i think uh who else do we have let's quickly rattle through these because we kind of got a bit on a string tirade there uh city of god slayer i regularly put uh on all night eight uh, sorry 528 hertz to sleep to i used 432 hertz last night uh i'm a great believer in frequencies and their power well i can't speak to that necessarily but music is literally that it's frequencies um and you know if we believe that uh music has an effect on us as humans which it obviously does then you know clearly frequencies have power that's all i'm gonna say about that uh so anyway uh who else do we have uh timothy appling is here once again we've already said hi to timothy timothy it's great to see you uh, i see we have a new person first place today yeah for sure the race to first with pj this evening uh which you know Makes me happy. I'm glad there's still a race. Larry Warren's in. Larry, it is good to see you. Uh, who else do we have? Mark Cranlis is very interested in this. We've got some good stuff for you. We also got some discussion around modelers. Uh, so Timothy Appling's bought a Headrush MX-5. Uh, decided to go for one of the cheaper compact units for starters uh, to get more acquainted with the latest technology. Now, my buddy Alan, uh, who is the other guitar player in Blitzkrieg, has an MX-5 to tour with and the uh, big Headrush um, for domestic shows. And he loves them. Sound absolutely fantastic. A bunch of them have made it onto the new album. What I would suggest is one of the best upgrades that we made to his uh, sound with his head rush was um, using some third-party IRs. Um, that made a huge difference to the sound. So if that's something you want to play with, maybe we'll talk about that another time because um, IRs are very, very interesting. Uh, anyway, let's crack on. So uh, response audio is in the house. I hope you're doing intervallically well today. I'm doing just fine, man. Intervallically, uh, c'est bon. Uh, intervallically full of hay fever, but apart from that, should stop moaning about that but you know anyway um who else do we have uh, steve mcd's chairman about the strings uh hi nick everyone i'm thinking about using 9 to 56 strings for ease and bending and accuracy that's not a bad shout uh, i think you meant 46 i'm imagining because 56 is oh there we are 46 not 56 i was like that's a very heavy low string but yeah i nothing wrong with it right this meme of uh you know you, you'll sound like you you'll suck if you play nines it's like nah your tone will be fine uh and you may find it easier you may find you have more stamina by contrast you may also find that you're less accurate because maybe your hands are very strong uh and i don't know and maybe you can't keep the lightest strings under control my thoughts on this matter are you should always use, always use the lightest gauge that you can control personally if you find yourself bending out of tune uh uncontrollably it's time to go up which is a position that i find myself in uh anyway what else do we have so we've got some great discussions about modeling uh we are going to uh get into that a bit later on because that's really really interesting hi boys hidden chords uh is it about superimposition or barry harris scales nice forgive the nerdiness uh we like a bit of that but you know it's kind of superimposition i guess you might call it extraction uh rather than superimposition per se uh mark Manish is in the house mark it's good to see you hello fellow gi friends uh making the uh, change to a stretch between index and middle finger for two fret fingering going well uh figured it would take longer now that's interesting because there are times when that is really really appropriate and there are times when it's better to use your third finger for sure but the ability to do that is very very important uh also gary moore made a whole career out of this uh and as did chris poland from megadeth and as you can see young me did that because uh i don't know how true this is but you can see how bent that middle finger is i think it's from doing 
doing this all the time, doing the old Andy James uh, when I was a kid. I am perfectly evolved to do that, uh, whereas doing this, less so. But, I, you know, we stick with it because it's the thing to do, and people will complain in the comments if I don't. Uh, Steve McD says, uh, I like the Richie Cotton Fly Rig. I like the Richie Cotton Fly Rig too. We had a stream on that uh, a couple of weeks ago. Really good fun. Very, very nice indeed. Uh, we'll get back to modelers uh, and all that sort of stuff. Uh, Cranky Tom is here. Cranky Tom is in Edinburgh. Had a great time in Newcastle. Make sure go and check out some live music and whistle binkies. It's not to be missed, right? Great venue. Bannerman's is wicked too, uh, if you want a cool dive bar with some rock and roll. Uh, Rory Lisman is here. Rory, it's good to see you. Thanks for coming on board. We're just going to breeze through some of this stuff. Keith MOF is here. Keith, it's good to see you. Thomas Ross, the Thomas Ross. Uh, hi, Nick, and hi, all in chat. Just got my PRS SE DGT after a long wait. I've not played one of those yet. I'm jealous because I'd love to play one of them. I think they look fantastic, like next generation stuff. Uh, my friend Craig is in. Craig, it's good to see you. Uh, uh, it's called Ben Jordy. Uh, I'll, I'll get to the bottom of that when we chat after the stream, I'm sure. Mustache Metal is here. It's good to have you back, man. Good to see you. A lot of love for the old Spark Mini, too. Uh, a lot of you guys are uh, using Spark Mini practice amps. I've got one here. I can see it. It's on a shelf uh, just behind my screen. Uh, anyway, uh, who else do we have? Kim is in Gateshead. Kim is no longer in Gateshead. Kim is on a train. Uh, last little comment on strings. Uh, Mal Riley picked up a an eight-string Schecter Damien guitar. Do you ever play eight strings? I am thoroughly intimidated by eight strings. I love seven strings. I think feel like the eight is just a bridge too far for me. I love the way they sound. I'll tell you what I do love. I love the way Sam Bell plays eight strings. And Sam has a course in GI+, Plus, no less. Um, where he um, he goes over extended range guitar ideas and it's fabulous. It is absolutely fabulous, right? Just a great, great, great course. Um, I would encourage you to check that out, right? If you have any weight string, Sam is your man. He's a wizard with that stuff. And that course is available as part of your GI Plus membership. So anyway, let's get into the meat of today's stream. Uh, today we are discussing, just a quick reminder, by the way, quick shout out to our sponsors, Elixir Strings. You've provided the strings for this and have also suggested this lesson because they really enjoyed the one that we did a couple of weeks ago because you guys were so cool as well, right? So they love the streams where you guys comment. So hey, if you want more lessons like this, make sure you comment and let us know. Uh, anyway, I've chosen a backing track today uh, that is in the key of A... Um, a minor, dead easy. I've lost the light already. It knows I'm clashing so badly with the blue. Uh, I'll fix that as we go. But uh, we've got a pink light and that's fine. Um, so chosen back and tracking the key of A minor because we can use the A minor pentatonic scale and the A natural minor scale to explore the concepts we're looking at today. First thing I want to do is I want to discuss the... I guess the difference between scales and chords, or the similarities between scales and chords too. But let's do some playing before we do any of that stuff. So what I want to do with you guys, let's throw the backing track on. We're going to play some stuff in A minor pentatonic. You can do this in your electric. I've cracked my acoustic out because I feel like the theory lessons tend to work quite well on acoustic. So it, you know, stops me from going all shred-tastic as well. So, um, although I'll try. But anyway, so we've got a backing track in key of A minor. It is, of course, available on the Guitar Interactive YouTube channel. But let's play our A minor pentatonic scale. So what do we got here? We've got one and four, that's our finger numbers, or frets five and eight, if you prefer. Fingers one and three, or frets five and seven, if you prefer. Going all the way across the next three strings. Then we have one and five, uh, sorry, one and four, one and four. So fret numbers, five, eight, five, seven, five, seven, five, seven, five, eight, five, eight. Let's do a little back and forward in this, just to familiarize ourselves sound of the pentatonic scale against the backing track, we all know how this sounds, but it's a good opportunity for a jam. So I'm going to play a little bit like this. If you've got your guitar, you can play along. So if I go... I'm just going to turn that up in my monitors a little bit. You take a turn. You have a go. I'll go so... take a look at a minor pentatonic scale and I want to see if we could find some chords that are nestled within the A minor pentatonic scale because they are out there because I mean I guess if we make the distinction between scales and chords let's talk about what's going on there so to my mind the scale or as a concept is 
probably best thought of as a hand in Scrabble. You guys have ever played Scrabble before? For anybody who hasn't, it's that game where you get word tiles. Um, and, you know, you get a little uh, a little tray to put them in and you get a, a hand of seven letters. It's your hand that you get to pick from. Uh, my contention is that your scale is like the hand in Scrabble. These are the letters that you're able to pick from. And from these letters, you're able to make a variety of words. And the words that you choose are chords. Now, if we had access to seven, uh, in this case, seven letters, which would be A, B, C, D, E, F, G, we're gonna pick five for the time being, so we're doing pentatonic. We can take any of those five letters and combine any three of them or more to create a chord. And when I say any, I literally mean any. So let's do some, right? Let's just throw some on real, real quick here. So if we take the A minor pentatonic scale once again, let's take a very, very obvious one. Let's take this note here, this note here, this note here. That, dear friends, is the venerable A power chord. Actually only has two notes in it, but even still, it's technically a dyad. Excuse me while I cough, because hay fever. Do apologize. You probably still heard that through the guitar, because the guitar's got a microphone on it, but even still, should probably mute them both. But we have uh, A, E, A. Doesn't really matter if we think about it as A, E, and A. We think about it more as three notes that are chosen from our A minor pentatonic scale. Are there any other places we could do this? Well, we could do it within the same fingering here and here. That would be another shout. We could do it here. We could do it here. Now, all of these are different power chords. We're playing an A power chord, a D power chord, a G power chord, and a C power chord, A, D, G, C, etc. Uh, and we're just choosing to play them as root fifth, root fifth, but we've chosen them from our pentatonic scale. Now, a way to think about this is if you take the scale shape, I would think about this as playing, uh, genuinely, I would think about it like this. I would think about playing the lower note on one string and then the higher note on the next two strings. We're gonna have two notes in each position. So we have low, high, high, dead easy. Now this gives us intervals of root fifth octave, root fifth octave, root fifth octave, root fifth octave. All of these are something that we can use. This is probably a really rudimentary example, but we'll get to some more complex ones as we go. These are all devices that we can use perfectly effectively in our solo. to uh, some jamming. So what we've got here, we've got some power chords here, 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 and here. What I want you to do is I want you to play with the idea of arpeggiating these power chords along with the backing track. And by arpeggiating, all I mean is just play one note at a time. Don't play them all together, right? You can play them all together, but we're gonna arpeggiate them as a way of demonstrating this. This stuff all has implications for songwriting too. So it's not just an improvisation thing, it's a songwriting thing too. We'll get onto that, but the easiest vehicle to learn this stuff with is improv. So let's get the back and track back on. We're in the key of A minor, we'll do this in turns. So if I start here, what I'll do is I'm gonna intersperse my typical minor pentatonic stuff with some of these power chord ideas. So what I would get is thus.
let's back out of that. We don't want to spend all day on that. We've got some great comments coming in already. Uh, our friend <laughs> Rothgar Thorgrimson, the best username of the day, uh, says, tasty stuff. Thank you very much, man. PJ says, that is so effective. It totally is right now. Are we playing arpeggios? Are we playing a scale? Yes. It's kind of both. Um, because all chords or uh, arpeggios can be derived from a scale. They can, they can be extracted from usually several scales uh, in the same way that a three-letter word like and or cow or cat or whatever, I don't know, I'm just saying three-letter words right now, um, can be extracted from several hands of seven letters if we're using the Scrabble idea. For example so that's that but let's go a little deeper with this right because there are some other chords that we can uh we can throw into um the mix with this so just sticking with pentatonic for the time being let's do instead of this idea of saying what happens if we play the low note then the high note then the high note let's flip that on its head so this time what happens if we play the high note on the low string then the low note on the next two strings what have we got going on here here we have C, D, and G. C and G are root and fifth. That is a sus2. So here we have C sus2, which is very cool. But our next one is not a C sus2. Our next one is an E, a G, and a C. We have a C major. That in itself is very cool too. What about if we play here? We have an A minor triad, and here we have a D sus2. But what I'm playing is I'm literally just playing low note, sorry, high note on the lowest string, low note, low note. So instead of this, I'm playing this. Am I worried about what chord I'm playing? Not particularly. I'm just thinking about a pentatonic scale and going, hey, let's just play that. Let's see what happens here. So uh, the reason I don't have to worry is because I know that at least in this context, as long as I choose notes from a pentatonic scale, I'm fine. I can stack them together in any order that I want, and I can stack them together in any combination I want, and we are good. So let me go back over the fingerings again, and then we'll do some more jamming. So what we have is we have the low note on, sorry, the high note rather, which is eight on the low E string, and then the low notes on the next two strings. Then we have low note, sorry, high note rather, low note, low note, which is A7, D5, G5. Same thing down a string, which is gonna be uh, D7, G5, B5. And then here we have, again, starting on the G string, low note, sorry, high note, low note, low note, which gives us seven, five, five. So we have eight, five, five, seven, five, five, seven, five, five, seven, five, five. See why I chose to do this in the acoustic. You can do this in the electric though and it sounds fantastic, especially if you've got a whammy bar. Do this stuff and give it a little bit of bar vibrato. You'll sound like, uh, I'm not gonna say you'll sound instantly like Jeff Beck, but you may sound a little bit like Steve Lukather, which is also a good thing. So anyway, let's throw the backing track on. Let's jam with that. And again, remember the important thing with this is not to be like, like an on off switch with this stuff, but to blend it in with your regular pentatonic playing. So what I might do is I might get something like this. Take a turn. You get 
the gist, and we're playing wonderful stuff, but it's just pentatonic. Even when I'm all the way up here, I'm just trying to stay as pentatonic as I can. Uh, occasionally I'll slip some of the notes in, but you get the gist. Okay, now, let's expand this a little bit further, because that's interesting in and of itself, but so far what we've done is we've kind of limited ourselves to playing uh, just one note on an individual string, but we can play more than one note on each string. So what we can do is we can develop some chordal ideas, if you want to call them that, or some arpeggio ideas, nested within our pentatonic scale that maybe have several notes on other strings. So what about this? Let's pick some at random, right? What if we played our power chord idea that we did before, but this time we treat ourselves to two notes on the higher of our string groups, right? Here we go. Ah, response audio with a great comment. Uh, it says, once you start joining up all the shapes of the pentatonic up the neck, you can create some super wide intervallic lines too. You sure can. And we're going to talk about that because when we start combining two pentatonic shapes, for example, don't know why I did it this way, like press and read, uh, as if I can play anything over this way. I absolutely cannot, let me tell you. Uh, apart from the occasional stunt lick. But, um, you know, we save those for the gig where people can <laughs> People can't um, necessarily hear all the fluffs um, unless it's a live recording and you get one of those in ear mixes and ah, my God, don't hear my mistakes. Anyway, it's not what we came to talk about. So we were talking about the power chord thing, right? So this is our power chord stuff. What about if we, instead of playing low note, high note, high note, we play low note, high note, and then low and high on the... Uh, the higher string of our three. So what we get is this. <laughs> Triple of feel with hyper picking works. Chef's kiss. I agree. Totally agree. Great comment. So what we might get with this is now we have, uh, we could refer to this a few different ways, but this is, Guess you could call it a minor seven. It's kind of not a minor seven. It could be A minor seven because of the context, but really it could also be A major seven. We don't know. So we could call it A Schrodinger's seven because there is no third to tell us what's going on there. We could call it A seven, no third. That would work. By the time we get here, we've got something different entirely. We've got this, which is going to be a, uh, what have we got here? We've got a G. We also have a six. So that could be a G six with no third. And this guy here, same thing. C six, no third. Isn't that lovely? I think that sounds absolutely gorgeous. So let's do the jam, right? We've got the backing track, same deal. I'm gonna go with something very akin to that, where I'm literally playing the two notes that we have available on the highest string, highest note on the next string, lowest note on the string below that. Tonic noodly blue stuff, which is great and I love, right? 
don't think I'm throwing that stuff under the bus. That stuff is important um, and is great, but it's also important if you want the audience uh, in most gigs to go, hmm, yes, I like the sound of the guitar. But for us guitar players, who are we're music people, this stuff sounds fabulous, really, really great. Uh, let's go a little step further, and then we'll start to talk about how you might play this with some chordal ideas too. Uh, so what we can also do with this, we can basically just choose this fairly at random. So some shapes that I tend to like, I tend to like uh, higher, lower, higher. That tends to work quite well. Etc. Etc. Ended up with a bit of a melodic minor thing there. It was very, very strange. to know what's going on? Nope, don't think so. But this stuff also works fantastically well played as chords. Because again, every note we have here because we've selected properly from our pool, every note we have here is basically justified. Does it mean it's gonna sound the same? Probably not, but is it gonna sound like it works? Yep, maybe. What am I playing there? What are all those chords called? Don't know, couldn't tell you, right? Don't even remember what they were. What they are is A minor pentatonic with some little deviations into Dorian, because why not? Little deviations into Aeolian too, but all I'm choosing is literally just a bunch of notes that I clustered at random within within this weak chord shape. And how does it sound against the track? Let's find out. the fact that I made some glaring errors, it sounds fabulous. As Sacred God Slayer has rightly pointed out, we're entering Alan's playground with cluster chords. This is Alan Holdsworth. Um, what we're really doing here is we're playing uh, something that I've re heard referred to as scale chords, which seems to be like a, a bit of a redundant term because all chords are scale chords. But still, uh, what we're doing here is we are taking a parent scale and we're just selecting three notes and moving them as randomly as we want. But what makes this work, makes it work particularly well, is if we have some degree of pattern among what we're playing. So if I took this as my little scale, for example, my little scale chord, which I'll show you, because it's lovely. In this case, it's gonna be seven, five, and eight on the D string, G string, B string. If I take this same idea of higher note, lower note, higher note, i.e. the higher note of the two on this string, the lower note of the two on this string, the higher note of the two on this string, and I just march this up my pentatonic positions, like so. Have we ended up something strange there? No, nope, that sounds pretty good. If I literally just march this up like so, sounds fantastic because there's a sense of pattern to the movement in the same way that this stuff if we just play random shred stuff and it's like there's no pattern to it at all it can sound a bit weird but when we start to do this that pattern or the same thing with this gives it something that you can hang your ear on, if that makes any sense. You can hang your ear hat 
I don't know. Um, strange way of putting it. We've got off into ears and hats. But that stuff is something that we're going to expand upon uh, next week when we get a little bit more into doing this with diatonic scales rather than just pentatonic scales. Because, of course, you don't have to do this with pentatonic stuff. You can do it with diatonic stuff too. But I wanted to give you guys uh, some time to digest that and to get it comfy if that makes sense because this is really valuable but what i don't want to do is bombard you with information and have you go oh i was totally with you until you started talking about uh seven note scales and then i fell off the earth so take a bit of time get your heads around this start using it in your own playing uh and then we'll start to do a little bit more on this stuff i love talking about this business but you know kind of difficult to uh i guess difficult to, to teach it to folks of all manner of different interests and uh different experience levels etc because you know some people out there are like major crazy shredders some people are big jazz cats some people just picked up the guitar for the first time yesterday even still you can use this stuff there is a place for you uh to get this into your own playing and we'll talk a little bit more about songwriting next week as well now before we get into the q a just want to take a quick second and show you this if you're at all interested in finding a little bit more about the uh I guess the modes thing, which we can get into. Uh, we've got a great course on that. This is a fantastic first step into uh, exploring the modes. This is Mastering Modes Part 1, which takes you uh, from Pentatonic Player into If that makes any sense. Dead, dead simple. Maybe master is an exaggeration, but it will definitely get you grappling with modes in a musical way that you can start using immediately. Check this out. When we come back, we'll be answering your questions. <laughs> Modes. What are modes? How do I use them? When do I use them? Well, modes are one of the things that the pros use to add excitement and colour to the guitar parts, and there is no reason why you can't use them too. Now, for some reason, people, especially certain online guitar teachers, love to make modes seem complicated and scary, but I'm here to tell you they really, really aren't. And in fact, if you know the pentatonic scale, I can show you how to play modes with just two extra notes. In this course, I'll show you how to play killer sounding guitar solos using modes without any of the mystery. You'll learn how to play musical sounding solos all across the neck in any key, crucially without sounding like you're just running up and down scales. So, if you're ready to take this next step with me, click the link to find out more. So there you go, guys. That's been a look at Mastering Modes Part 1. It's one of the courses that's available as part of your GI Plus membership. You can get your GI Plus membership down here, guitarinteractivemagazine.com forward slash GI Plus. Let's get into the questions, though, because we've had a bunch of really good ones this week. Uh, we're going to start with the discussion around modelers, because uh, why not? Modelers are fun. Uh, a lot of chat going on here. Uh, so uh, Timothy Appling, for a bit of background, in case anybody's just come on board, Timothy Appling uh, has bought Headrush, uh, MX5, fantastic pedal board, really, really cool, super compact, dead, dead easy to use, uh, sounds great. Um, so we've got some discussion uh, again from here from uh, Timothy Appling saying, I would say the Fractal FX3 uh, Mark II, have they really done uh, an Axe FX3 Mark II? Just call it the Axe FX4. I don't know. Uh, bizarre. Who who am I to comment, right? I'm in the middle of uh, finishing an album, right at the final stages, and I've got like folders and folders and folders of stuff uh, called um, things like the Spider Final Version 3.2.4. 
uh, base up one DB. So I don't know, right? I'm not the person to talk about naming conventions right now because I'm deep in that weird world uh, of mixed revisions and everybody wanting uh, a little bit more me, please. Um, anyway, um, so what we're talking about? Yeah, anyway, so uh, the Fractal FX3 uh, Mark II uh, has the most advanced processor and uh, adjustable variables for their effects modeling, effects slash modeling, but also means the highest learning curve and price by far. The learning curve thing is really interesting. So my friend Steve Dawson, uh, who was the head designer at Marshall for a long time. Um, he's the guy responsible for the Astoria, for the Vintage Modern, uh, the Class 5. He did a bunch of other really great amps too. He loves the uh, Fractal stuff because he's an amp designer and he knows what things like Ripple and, uh, and SAG do. Um, and, you know, all these kind of... Uh, I guess these variables that you can adjust in things like the power supply or the transformer, etc. We can really get deep with that stuff. He absolutely loves that stuff. Me personally, uh, I used to love that stuff. I have now become totally averse uh, to that sort of thing because I don't have the mental energy to deal with that sort of thing, I don't think. Um, <coughs> pardon me, I beg your pardon. Um, <coughs> but yeah, it, the, the fractal stuff, there is no denying that it sounds great. Uh, here's another one, especially when you add the 12 foot pedal, uh, the Fractal FM9, Neural Quad Cortex and Line 6 products uh, would seem the closest to the FX3, just my opinion. Uh, I am a big Quad Cortex fan. You guys know that already. Um, so the reason I like the Cortex and the reason I chose that myself um, is to my mind, the amp modeler thing uh, falls into two different camps. There is the uh, I want to use the tones inside this device and I want this to generate all of my tones or there is the I have amps that I love uh, and I want to be able to take them with me uh, or approximate those as closely as I can. I fall into the second camp. So for me, the Quad Cortex is it because I could have gone Kemper, um, but I really like the workflow aspect of the Cortex and I, I can't really speak to how accurate it is compared to a Kemper. Um, I, I'm told it's more accurate, but I don't know. Um, I guess people just say that about their favorite football team. I don't know. Um, but what I will say is that it's definitely accurate enough. Um, when I've AB'd some stuff against my amps, and I'm going between the two. I'm going, if there's a difference, I don't care. Um, I do care in the studio. That's where it makes a difference. Because in the studio, we do everything, uh, everything possible to make things as good as they possibly can be. And I think there probably is a little bit of a difference, but it's close enough. But the reason I chose that is because uh, I'm not really interested in using the amp models that are contained within. I'm sure they're great, but that's not really my area of interest. I want to take my amps, I want to put them in a tiny box that I can get in an airplane, uh, basically, for want of a better, a better explanation. So that's why I chose that. But uh, one thing that, makes a huge difference in my opinion is um and this is kind of powerful and dangerous is first of all um finding some irs that you really like or finding one really great ir that you're really into sticking with it um another thing is the eq side of things now i am probably controversially uh i'm not a fan of low passing um, guitars or high cutting guitars um, when it comes to modeling stuff don't really like that I feel like there's some stuff up there that I want uh, I think generally speaking what people want is when they start doing this high passing thing which is something you'll play with there's normally some specific frequencies in the upper mid range going into low treble that they want to get rid of but I don't think the answer to that is to get rid of all the frequencies up there I feel like notches uh, there's normally you normally need a couple. You'll normally need one somewhere around three to four K-ish. And there's normally one somewhere between five and seven. Sometimes there's two up there. So uh, recently I've been notching some uh, recorded guitars using my favorite IRs. Um, I had to notch 3.2 K, 5 K-ish, and somewhere up around seven K. Um, best done with headphones where you can hear all this sort of stuff. Um, I feel like that's a great way to keep the, um, 
the life in your tone, but your third party IRs will definitely help for this. In case you're wondering what IR means, uh, because we're not going to assume knowledge here, IR is uh, basically a snapshot of a speaker cab that's been mic'd um, in a studio somewhere. So, or it can be done anywhere, done in somebody's bedroom, I guess, if they want to, or the bathroom, or, you know, back of somebody's truck, I don't know. But it's normally in a studio. Um, and normally what will happen is people will take a great sounding cab, a great sounding mic setup, they'll then shoot some signal uh, sounds through that setup, record the result, and then that's available to you as a file that you'll then place into your modeler, and you will load that in lieu of the speaker cab. Now, this is generally one place where modelers tend to fall down, is the internal IRs. I don't know why. Some of them are great. Fr Fractal have fantastic ones. To be fair, Neural have really great ones too. And there's a big movement among the Line 6 guys at the minute to uh, show the stock cabs some love. They're all fine. The thing I like about IRs is once you've picked a good one, there are no parameters to mess with. You go, this is good. I am loading this. I know it's good. And anything else that I need to adjust happens upstream, right? I have taken the infinite variations of miking and cabinet choice out of the equation. I've chosen something that I know is good. And if, uh, if it's too bright, it's not the mic position it's probably the amp or it's probably something like that. I like to remove that level of option anxiety. The same reason why I don't use amp models, where I use snapshots of my amp, because if I go, okay, here is uh, a sound that I've dialed in and I like the uh, I, I like the amp, I like the cab, I know they work well together, but on a particular day, I'm like, hmm, I don't know, maybe it's a bit too trebly. I go, well, no, this is a combination that works. There are no real settings to play with. It's probably just the room. The front of house engineer will get it. It's fine. And uh, I get on with my life and I play my guitar, which is nice. <laughs> so we got a little bit of that. That's some fun stuff to play with. But yeah, um, getting to grips with some uh, some EQ can really, really, really help. We've got some great comments that are coming about that. Just going to touch on those uh, very, very quickly. Some more questions too. Uh, some lovely lovely comments as well uh, from Frank Tom saying, lovely stuff again, inspires me and opens some doors. Hey, thanks, man. I appreciate that. Very, very good of you. Um, what else do we have? Um, we've got some other cool questions too. Um, I focus on writing music, says uh, T Midi Man, and rightly you should. Um, ultimately, if we're not playing somebody else's song, we are writing music uh, at all times. Improvising is just composing in real time. Uh, for sure, yeah, with you on that. Um, here we go. Uh, don't use um, the IRs anymore. Um, after Line 6 is rework of the stock cabs, they are very, very good. You know, I haven't played with the reworked stock cabs, but everybody says they're fantastic. The thing I don't like about it is, um, again, it's just the, the, sh the sheer weight of options there. I'm like, oh my God, there's so many. What if I do this? What if I do this? What if... It takes me a thousand years um, to go like, oh, I've got a cab sound that I like. And by that point, I've lost all impartiality. I have, um, we've got the folder of IRs here. Um, folder of IRs uh, of me and some of my friends on a forum collected on the net. All that stuff was released for free. Wow, that is a lot of IRs. If we had some place to share, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, we need a forum. Uh, thing is, right, I've got a, a huge collection of IRs too, but what I also have is a little favorites folder, uh, which has about six um, that are basically... Here's one that is uh, like vintage 30s um, in a Mesa cab, Mike Fredman style that I use for metal. Um, here's one which is um, these really linear sounding greenbacks um, that I've got a Roya and a 57. I use that for most stuff. That's my lead cab. I've got a couple of Fender and Vox type cabs I use for specific things. And I've got, um, oh yeah, I've got a greenback 4x12 as well, like actual legit greenbacks, um, might with a single 57. Uh, that is the classic rock IR. And unless something goes very, very wrong with those, I won't reach for any of the others. I'll be like, okay, start here. If these don't work, think about other stuff. Uh, Team Mini Man says, Nicky, think like a professional when it comes to gear. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Um, I kind of have to, you know, I haven't got the mental space to deal with any of that stuff. I just got to get on with playing music. Um, here's another one. Uh, Zeta Impulses on YouTube. Very good and totally free. A fantastic recommendation. I'm going to go and check that out too. Uh, check that out too. So anyway, got another question that came in. Um, 
Two more questions, and we'll get to both of these. So Mustache Metal says, have you ever experienced discomfort in the right wrist slash forearm when practicing picking, e.g. with intense uh, alternate picking practice? Any suggestions for this? I certainly have, uh, and let me tell you uh, a few reasons why. So, um, I got a lot of, um, I picked up a lot of injuries in both wrists when I was a kid uh, from falling over a lot. And when I say a kid, uh, I mean like, you know, 12 through to about 16, uh, which is a lot of falling off skateboards. Um, not very good in a skateboard, it turns out. Uh, and then the usual deal, like play fighting with my mates and all that sort of thing. I would fall over a lot. My wrist took a battering for some reason. Um, so I've got a little bit of tendonitis in both wrists. I don't know whether it's an overuse thing from practicing guitar a lot when I was a band, uh, which is young person for anybody uh, not from, you know, our neck of the woods or the next of the woods that use bands or that bands are available. Um, so, yeah, um, I got injuries in both wrists. Um, the deal with this sort of thing is that uh, discomfort in this sort of thing is almost always a dose issue. Uh, and what I mean by dose issue is a question of how much you're doing. I would probably argue that if you play some intense alternate picking stuff and it leads you to some wrist discomfort, there's probably an amount of that that you can do. Let's say, for example, we took this as... Because intense is different for different people, but let's say we took this as our example. Right, that's some alternate picking. If we decide to go a little bit more intense, we could. But let's say, for example, this doesn't cause you any discomfort. Then there is an amount of alternate picking you can do that will not lead to discomfort. Let's say you do that for half an hour and you start to get a little bit of cramping and discomfort. What this says to me is that the amount you're practicing or the amount of stuff that you're doing has just exceeded your ability to tolerate it, um, which is not a big deal. Uh, what it means is you go, okay, chalk that up to experience, let's just move on from there and maybe do a wee tiny bit less. Uh, what I would say is uh, it's not usually good to practice if you have red flag syndromes, uh, which sorry, red flag symptoms, which would be things like, uh, you know, acute sudden discomfort that maybe has radiation uh, associated with it, it's radiating to other parts of your body, or you have loss of uh, you have weakness or um, any of that kind of thing. But if it's just li like good old fashioned starting to burn, uh, that's kind of okay. You can just sort of stop there and just like, you know, maybe do a little bit less next time um, in terms of the duration or in terms of the intensity. Other things you can do, you can lighten up the picking uh, grip can help sometimes. Um, or honestly, just take short abouts, take breaks more regularly. Uh, a thing with this to remember as well is that hurt does not always equal harm. Um, and that pain has many inputs, uh, including but not limited to biological, psychological, and social inputs. If you're interested in that stuff, barbell medicine. There you guys. Um, but you know, and also you want to become very strong. There you guys. Um, but that's not what we're here to talk about. So the uh, biopsychosocial model of pain and injury definitely worth a read if you're experiencing issues like this. Uh, it's fascinating because uh, often we uh, perceive pain. We experience pain, rather, uh, as a perception of threat. Um, so we perceive some um, threat of injury to the body and we experience pain as a result of that. Um, but that's, I guess, discomfort is probably the best way to put it. What I would say, anyway, is um, just back down the dose a little bit. And by dose, I mean the amount that you're doing. This can mean just doing shorter bursts or it can mean doing less duration. That would be my suggestion for that stuff. So yeah, familiar with that. And that is kind of a blanket answer for all things pain when it comes to playing. Uh, we'll talk more about that again, but I should caveat that as well and say, this is not medical advice. I am uh, not a doctor and I'm definitely not your doctor. Um, so if it persists, Talk to your physician. Uh, response audio. In certain keys, uh, it might be a good a good practice to start mapping out these pentatonic uh, shape chords and leaving the open strings in them where they fit. That's a fantastic shout. Very, very good. Very, very, very good. Um, so what you may do with this uh, is, let's say we took A, for example. Wonderful chords that contain the open strings. 
not playing the harmonic, suddenly you're polyphia, um, which I'm not going to try and do in the acoustic guitar. I can't do that stuff. Uh, I should learn, though, because people ask about that sort of stuff. So, yeah, it's a very good idea. Very, very good idea indeed. Anyway, listen, so, guys, that's all the time we've got for this week, but we're continuing this discussion next week. So what I want you to do, uh, is when you take some time with this stuff, um, explore it as fully as you can and come next week armed with this knowledge so that we can then explore some stuff with uh, seven note scales. So uh, I'm going to leave you guys there. We're going to play a little bit more of the backing track. Uh, thank you so much for joining me. My name is Nick Jennison, the Guitar Interactive GI Plus. Once again, I want to shout out today's sponsors, Elixir Strings, who have not only kindly suggested this lesson uh, because they really liked it when we did it last time. So if you enjoy what we did today, maybe go to Elixir's uh, so social stuff and check them out uh, as a way of saying thank you but also they provided the strings which still sound great which we're going to jam on in just a minute thank you so much my name is Nick Jennison from Guitar Interactive I want to thank you guys for the kind comments as well really glad you enjoyed this week's stream I enjoyed putting it together too it's been a gas so let's play some more and I'll see you guys next week My name is Nick Jennison and it's a pleasure to introduce to you GI Plus, the brand new lesson platform brought to you by Guitar Interactive. We've assembled a team of the best players and educators in the world to bring you exclusive lessons covering everything from metal to blues to fusion and everything in between. Want to level up your shred chops? Check out How to Play Fast by Andy James. Or how about Sweet Picking with Rick Graham? Or maybe country's more your bag. Well, how about a full-length exclusive country guitar course from Andy Wood? Interested in learning how to play over changes? Well, members get access to hours of exclusive lessons from fusion maestro Tom Quayle. Or maybe you want your playing to sound more soulful. Well, who better than Chris Buck to show you how it's done? Or perhaps you want to learn the secrets of the masters. Well, members get access to over 60 feature-length tech sessions where our tutors painstakingly decode the styles of players like David Gilmore, Eddie Van Halen, John Petrucci, Larry Carlton, Flash, Tosh Nabassi, Paul Gilbert, and many more. You get all this along with exclusive live webinars, free backing tracks, competitions, and so much more. So what are you waiting for? Sign up for GI Plus today.